Question, does anybody like hot sauce? Hot sauce, you like hot sauce? All right, here's a video about hot sauce. Check it out. Habanero peppers, okay. Chipotle puree, I, I think I can do this one. There's something about this one. Wait. It's called Beyond Insanity, bro. It sounds like the worst circuit, worst hit circuit ever. Sean, why would we go Beyond Insanity on a Tuesday morning at 11.48 or afternoon at 12.53 or whatever it is? I know. We're just going, to, uh, that's it? You know, I'm just, I'm on your schedule here. All right, so, whoa, going right in. It hasn't kicked in yet. Maybe it won't. <laughs> mm, I think this is where it starts to, uh, Yeah. That is where you turn the corner, though. Yeah. It gets hot right there. A different. Yeah, it does. A different vibe altogether. <laughs> yeah. Unusual that the first thing it hits from here is your eyeball. Uh, I might ask you to spoon me in a second. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you need. Whatever you need to get through it. Oh, wow, that comes in strong. Yeah. They all have their pitfalls. Oh. And it grows, and it grows, and it grows. Woo. Ah. Ow. <laughs> wow! Wow! Wow. Wow. That's hot. I have one question. Why? Why? Like, what is wrong with these people? It just doesn't make any sense. You're a bunch of fools, okay? Just let that, let's just put that out there. However, we cannot go through life. Would anybody like to go through life without any spices at all? Anybody? Like, seriously. Like, if you go through life without any spices, there's a word for that. It's called bland, okay? So I brought, like, you might say, well, I don't like hot sauce. Does anybody like mustard? Come on, a little bit of audience participation here. Do you like mustard? How about this? Ketchup. Yes, yes. My one grandson wouldn't eat cereal without ketchup. I mean, he's into ketchup and honey mustard. He's got to have honey mustard. Like all these, this is all seasoning. Here's some spicy brown mustard. Got to have that. Anybody like salad just dry? I do. <laughs> You and me, you and me, a dry, but you know, can you imagine, how about wings? Anybody like pizza, like wings, like wings? No, you don't. You like the sauces that go with the wings. People will say, anybody here like uh, eating dandelion? See, see, there, there we go, Walter. You don't like eating dandelion, Walter, that's not true. You like the dandelion dressing, the bacon, hot bacon dressing that's on it. If you really like, those of you who say you like dandelion, go out and chew some dandelion right now. There's, there's dandelion, plenty of dandelion out there. How about anybody like uh, rice and put on some soy sauce in the rice? You like soy? I like soy. How about, how about tacos? Do you want to eat tacos without taco, taco seasoning? Seriously. Or chili without chili powder? I mean, what, what's the point of eating it? And then finally, Deanna's favorite topping. You know what Deanna's favorite topping is? There's Deanna's favorite topping, Hershey's syrup, nothing like that. Well, if we don't have any toppings, if we don't have any sauce, if we don't have any spices, the, the word to describe that life is bland, and it's just not, it's just not cool. So here's what I want to read this morning. Here's a scripture I want to jump off of. It's something Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, so he's talking about a lot of great things, but in the front of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading it, verse 16 through, 13 through 16, verse 13, Jesus says this about us. He says, you are the, of the, you're, who's you? We are you, right? We are you, you are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. You're not, you know what you're not? You're not the salt of the church. Now, I got salt shaker collection here. Debbie Zimmerman, she's sitting out there. Where are you, Debbie? I don't see her. Oh, she's all the way back there. Okay. So this is some of the things. She thought she, thought she had more before they moved, so she probably did. But these are all salt shakers. Back. Um, Debbie has, here's a, a, a Christmas tree and a uh, snowman and and he, I think an Easter bunny in it. <coughs> oh man, that hot sauce on top of the uh, on top of the goldfish really got me. But these are 
salt shakers. Now, De- uh, Debbie probably, I don't know where, but she puts them on display somewhere, right? She probably doesn't have all of these on her table, and she's going to use all of these at the same time. She puts them on display. Have you ever seen, like, display cabinets where people put salt shakers in? Anybody see that? You know what? What does Scripture say again? Forget. You are the salt of the earth. You know what it doesn't say? You're the salt of the church. Like, if you could put these on a shelf. When I was in junior high school in shop class, I made a uh, spice rack. Anybody ever see a spice rack? All right? And you put spices on the spice rack. Uh, that's where you could put these, like on some kind of rack or display. And here's what I was thinking. I was thinking, you look like a bunch of salt shakers on a rack, wooden racks. Here's what that would look like right here. Picture. <laughs> right? Right? Now, is that correct biblically? I don't think so. It doesn't say you are the salt shakers of the church or you're the salt of the church. It says you are the salt of the world. And we got to get out of the church into the world. That's what the Bible is calling for us to do. we got to get into the world and live for Jesus. That's what he wants us to do. Not hang in the church. This morning I want to continue with Moses. I was talking about Moses last week. Remember Moses was born at a dangerous time to be born in Egypt. He was a Hebrew slave or born to Hebrew slaves, Jewish slaves. And uh, the king had decided that the population of slaves is increasing too dramatically. Um, it, it, they need to be reduced in number or they could rise up in a riotous kind of way and begin to make trouble. So he gives an order that the oldest, the, the children, the ba- male boys that are two years old and younger, which would have included Moses, they're going to be put to death. So there's an idea that comes to Miriam, Moses' sister, and his mother that I think ultimately came from God. And that's, we got to save his life. And they put him in a basket, and put him in the Nile River, and he floated down. And sure enough, by God's grace, he was rescued by the Pharaoh's own daughter. And, 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 and I think that was all part of God's deal. Reason being, God had a plan for Moses' life. Moses was raised in the palace. He was raised by the Pharaoh's own daughter. He came to learn the, the Egyptian culture, the Egyptian language, the Egyptian political system, and how things worked and how to get things done. That's, that's what he learned. And it was all, in my opinion, orchestrated by God because God had a plan for Moses' life as to how he was going to use Moses. How many of you think God has a plan for your life? Like that's everybody. God has a plan for every one of our lives. He wants to use every single one of us in this room, every one of you listening online. He wants to use all of us. He has a purpose for all of our lives, every one of us. The question is, how are we to be used? There was an idea that came to me, or I was introduced to, I should say, a bunch of years ago, that gives a tip as to how I might serve. It's called, the idea is called holy discontent. Discontent, something that, you might be discontent about that God could use might give you an indication as to where you should serve. Let me explain it this way. Let's pretend you, you have something that discontents you. Uh, let, let me try it this way. Anybody here notice anything about the church that's disturbing to you this morning? And raise your hand if you see anything disturbing. What's disturbing? Anybody, pro, anybody have a trouble with, the, with this alignment of the altar covers this morning? Anybody have a problem? Anybody want to come up here and fix this? Raise your hand. Hi, raise your hand if you want to come up and fix it. I'm not going to make you come up and fix it. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, just raise your hand if it disturbs you. Anybody disturbed by that? Those are sickies in the room, okay? They have mental issues here. They can't handle things that are out of order. Like my wife, I knew that this would pull her chain immensely. Like she... I'm slightly colorblind, so I said to her this morning, does this tie work for the shirt? Yes, but she hates the shirt because the buttons open up here. She said, see, that's even coming up. She doesn't like the buttons. She doesn't like this collar. It doesn't lay down right. Like, she has some serious problems for which there needs some medication or something. I don't really know what the deal is with her. But you know what? That's an area of discontent for some of us. Like that's, ooh. Now, imagine if, it, if something disturbs us, churns us up, 
that could perhaps be used by God. Example, anybody here really care about children and what happens to children? And you just really don't like some of the stories you hear about children being harmed in various ways. It just cranks you up. That's called holy discontent. Like this really, that bothers me. Oh, I can't bear that. What's happening to children might really bother you. It's a holy discontent that God could use. It's a discontent that you've got to think, God, what do you want me to do with this, this realm of discontent? Or maybe, maybe you're a person that sees somebody on the periphery that's not included and you just don't like someone not feeling included. It stirs in you. It eats at you. It's a discontented spirit. It's like, ah. Or, or maybe you... You, you got the idea. Maybe it bothers you that some people don't have enough food to eat. And it just, what can I do to correct that issue? It's, it's like a, an area of your life that's discontented and it becomes holy when it's put in the hands of God. That's what happened to Moses. Moses was saved, raised in the palace, and now he's an adult. And I think every so often he went outside to see the slaves because it bothered because he knew his heritage. He knew he was one of them. And he knew that it could have been him that was being abused. And he would go out and he'd see the abuse of the slaves and he, it just bothered him. And he went out, I think, periodically. And it just, it, something drew him to that. It, it troubled him. Like you might be troubled about something else. It troubled him. Somebody had to do something about this. Terry Snyder wanted to run up and correct this thing. It bothered her. Moses was bothered by what was going on with the slaves. And then it says this. I referenced this. I referenced this last week. It says, during his visit, one time he went out, during his, Moses' visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. And, and, and likely this guy could be beaten to death. He saw this guy being beaten severely. And after looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. Why? Because he couldn't handle it. This was wrong. It's like, I can't handle this altar covering like this. This is wrong. Moses couldn't handle the injustice of how the Hebrew slaves were being treated. He couldn't bear it. Anybody ever go down south and see any of the, to take any kind of slave tour? Oh, man. One time, Deanna and I were in Charlotte, North, Charlotte, South Carolina, and we took a walking tour of Charlotte. And one of the places, we went to places where the slaves were, the slave quarters, we went to a place. It just blew me away. We went to a place where they actually, all off, actually off, auctioned off slaves. Just troublesome. That's what happened to Moses. He was troubled about this. This, this really bothered him. It was his area of discontentment. Discontentment. And then he, he took the man, he, he got the guy, came to the rescue of this one guy, this one uh, Hebrew slave, and he killed the Egyptian, buried him in the sand, and then the next day he discovered that somebody had seen him, and he ran off to Midian. And he established a new life. He found a wife, he found, he, they had some children, he worked for his father-in-law, he was going to inherit the, the sheep branch, so to speak. He, it was, he was sitting pretty, everything was going well, but inside of him, God had given him a discontentment about injustice. That's what troubled him. What troubles you? He was troubled about injustice. And in a sense, what he experienced was a drive-by volunteer opportunity. I mentioned that last week. I said, drive-by volunteering is not a biblical concept. Like, they could ask over there. Somebody over there could say, hey, could you help us at Z-World this one time? And you say, yeah, I can help one time. That's not biblically correct. It's like me speaking to my hand and saying, hey, hand, can you be a hand to, uh, for an hour or two? I need you today because I want to swing a hammer for an hour. And the, and the hand says back to me, yeah, I'll do it for an hour, but after that I'm checking out, I'm not going to be a hand anymore. No, the hand is a hand. Its identity is a hand. This hand is a hand, and you might be a teacher of God's Word. Like you just are driven by the desire for people to understand God's word. Or you're driven by a desire to see that children are not mistreated. Or you're driven by a desire to encourage people that need encouragement or feeling defeated. You're driven by that. But you do not have the opportunity, if that's what is in you, you're not given the opportunity to just do that occasionally. 
You've been given a gift. The scripture calls it a spiritual gift. You have a spiritual gift, and my hand is always a hand, and if you have the gift of teaching, you're always a teacher. It's, it's part of your identity. Well, here Moses is, and he has a drive-by opportunity. You might say, you might be asked, hey, can you teach one week? And you say, yes, I do. And then you find out, I enjoyed that. Moses had a drive-by opportunity where he saw this abuse taking place and he stepped up and he defended the guy and he stepped up and saved the life of one Hebrew slave. But God was going to call him to save not just one Hebrew slave. He was going to, sa- he was going to call, call Moses to save the life of a whole nation of Hebrew slaves. It was a drive-by volunteer opportunity that Moses was given to explore what his passion was. That's what we need to do. We need to, we need to continue to pursue drive-by opportunities, not for the purpose of, yeah, I'll do this occasionally, but to figure out where we really fit. Do you understand where I really fit? Because there's a place for me. And I try this and this and this and this until I figure out what really does fit for me. What is my holy discontent? I read a book one time on parenting or some sub area of the book where one guy said this opinion that may or may not be right, but he said, I think parents should say yes far more times than they say no. Yes to things. Yeah, you can do Yes, encourage the children rather than discourage them. And I think that's what we should do with God. If somebody asks you, hey, could you volunteer? You should say yes as often as you possibly can to explore. What is it that God really wants me to do? What's my holy discontent? Where do I fit? That's what you should do. So at any rate, Moses, he goes off into the land of Midian, and he's living a sweet life. And then he has a calling from God. Anybody have any idea how old Moses was? Take a guess. No, 80. He's 80. Okay, he's 80 years old, and he has a couple of kids, and he's a wife, and his life is established. How many people that are 80 years old typically will say, let the younger people do it? Right? I've done my thing. How many people, when they're 80 years old, think, I can't serve anymore. I'm too old. I talked to somebody in the first service like that. Would like to teach Sunday school, but says, I'm too old. I said, you are not too old. Like, that's not true. But some of us, we like to think, well, I'm too old. Or I, you know what? I have children. I have, I have my hands full. I have my hands full, right? Moses had his hands full too. Yeah, his, he had children, but it, it didn't matter. Here, here's what the scripture says. Listen to this. Jesus says this to all of us, including essentially Moses, where he says, you are all the light of the world. And you're not, you're not supposed to be salt shakers sitting in a pew somewhere. You're supposed to go out into the world. You've got to figure out your path as to how God wants you to serve him. Now, some of you might be saying, why, well, I already volunteer." Yeah, what do you do? Well, I, uh, I coach soccer. Or I coach baseball, right? Anybody here coach anything? Ever coach anything? Anybody ever coach anything, right? We've, we've coached things, right? We might coach something, and you might say, I coach. That should count. Actually, it doesn't, perhaps. It might, but it might not. It depends, because here's what Jesus said about salt and, uh, and light. He says this. He says, you're the salt of the earth, but what good is it if it loses saltiness? Can you make it salty again if it will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless? And you're the light of the world. That's another metaphor. You're the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. You're supposed to be light. You're supposed to be salt. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. What's the purpose of that? Like, why would you do that? then it's not effectively a light or salt, effectively salt if it stays in the shaker. Instead, a lamp is placed in a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, this is the part you need to hear, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Everyone praise your heavenly Father. Now, let's say you're an excellent coach. You're an excellent coach. You coach soccer, baseball, softball, whatever you coach. You're an excellent coach. That's terrific. And and actually, there's parents that actually request that you coach their child because you're such a great coach. You're so encouraging, so positive. You're just really amazing coach. And people come to you and say, oh, oh, man. And, And sometimes, have you ever had this experience? Maybe you have been a coach. Hey, thank you so much for being a coach for my child. You're a great coach. 
Are you pleasing God in that respect? Listen to this. Are you fulfilling Jesus' words? He says, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise who? Your heavenly father. And when they say, you're the best coach ever on the history of the planet, that's a wonderful thing. It's noble to do. I encourage you to do it. But it doesn't count in spreading light, the light of Jesus, the salt of Jesus around the world. Because when we do good things, like coaching or whatever else we might do, at the end, the result should be not that they praise you and say, you're a really great coach, but rather so they say they give praise to the Heavenly Father. That's what counts. That's when we salt are starting to be the kind of salt that God wants us to be in the world. It's, it's where people begin to praise God. And so it's fine that you coach, but if you want to obey this scripture, you're the light salt of the earth, you need to find another way to serve in addition to coaching because you're not drawing anybody to Jesus. And you might say, but I can't. I'm in a secular league. I can't talk about Jesus. I'm not supposed to talk about Jesus. Not in that environment, I'm not supposed to. My response, yeah, you can. You're a volunteer, right? Or you get paid peanuts. Like, you can. You can. What are they going to do? Fire you? You can. You're called to be higher allegiance to Jesus Christ. You are called to be salt of the earth. And if, if you're not salt of the earth in the context of coaching soccer, then you've got to find something additional to do. But you could double dip if you serve Jesus while coaching. The question is, how do you do that? How can you coach, serve Jesus in the way that it would please him? Like, how do you go about that? Here's, here's what you can do. Just imagine that you're coaching soccer or softball or whatever. You're, you're, you're in the sideline. You're the assistant coach right now. And you know who the main coach is? The main coach is Jesus. Here's how you learn how to coach. Watch Jesus in terms of how he does it. Now think through the biblical stories, just in your head. Jesus goes to all kinds of places and all kinds of settings. And when he's in all these different places and all these different settings, what's he doing often? It doesn't matter where he is. He could be at a wedding, he could be at a funeral, he could be just walking the streets. Often what Jesus ends up doing is talking about the Heavenly Father. He just works it in to normal conversations. Well, my father says this, my father says that, he's just talking about his Heavenly Father. And, and if Jesus was coaching on the sideline of any kind of sport or any kind of activity, I guarantee you Jesus would be talking about the Heavenly Father. And I don't think people would necessarily be offended and report him and say, get rid of this coach. You know why? Because earlier this year, I was talking about what caused people to follow Jesus. You remember that set of sermons? What causes people to follow Jesus? And in that set of sermons, I said, maybe people follow Jesus because he rose from the dead or maybe because he uh, did miracles. But I think part of the reason people follow Jesus is because of who Jesus was. Remember who Jesus was? I talked about it for nine weeks. Jesus embodied love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's who he was. He embodied that. So let's pretend that Jesus is on the sideline and he's coaching a game. Number one, he'd be talking about the Father many times. It'd just come into his conversation because Father God is everything to Jesus. But at the same time, here's what his demeanor, his approach, his character would be like as he coaches. He would be the embodiment of love, joy. Think about it. Just absorb it for a minute. Just absorb the idea that Jesus is coaching your son or daughter in a sport, whatever the sport is, and Jesus as coach is the embodiment of. How would you like a person who is the embodiment of the following coaching your kid? Think about it. Jesus is the embodiment of love. And he's coaching your kid. The embodiment of love. Joy. Peace. Patience. How many co coaches could use more patience? Kindness. How many coaches could use more kindness? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Imagine that the coach coaching your child is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. How many of you would like your kid coached by a coach like that? I would. 
Man, because coaching ultimately, no offense, but your kids are not, nor are mine, going to be professional baseball players or soccer players or whatever. They're not going to do it. They're not that good. It's not about being a professional. It's about being shaped into a character person, and Jesus would be the most amazing coach. So you're saying to me, how could I let your light so shine before people they would see your good works and praise your Father in heaven? How could I get people to praise God? You just, be, you just coach your children like Jesus would coach children. You talk about the Father naturally, and you love them, and you have joy and peace and patience and kindness and good. You know what? You might get some complaints every now and then. He talks too much. She talks too much about Jesus or the Father. Yeah. But look at all the upside of that coach. They want to fire you, somebody else will use you. Is there that up? You see what I'm saying? So if you want to serve Jesus in the world as we're instructed to, you are called to be not salt shakers in pews on display. You're called to go out into the world and be salt and light in the world. You be Jesus as a soccer coach. And you serve him in that way. And if you can't do that, or that's not your thing, you're not a soccer coach, then there's another way. You know what you do? You partner up with other Christians and you work together to serve Jesus. There's a word for that. Listen to it again. Think about what the word is. You partner up with other Christians to serve Jesus. What is that called? That's called the church. That's what the church is. The church is where Christians come together and say, hey, let's do something good in the name of Jesus. And that's what the people in the room over here are advocating for. They're just trying to get us to partner together to serve Jesus Christ. That's, that's what we're trying, that's what we're attempting to do. We're trying to work together to serve Jesus Christ and, and, and build up his kingdom. But let me tell you something about this. It's not easy. It's not easy serving Jesus. Not easy serving Jesus in the church. It's not easy serving Jesus while soccer coach. You know why? Because it wasn't easy for Moses. Here's what happened to Moses. Moses' first task, you may not realize it, was simply not to take the people out of their slavery. It was just to say, hey, can the people leave Egypt for a bit of time so that we can go out in the wilderness and worship God? Can we just go out in the wilderness and worship God? And Pharaoh, the king, he lost his mind. What? You're kidding me. I'm not going to let you go. And then the Pharaoh said, you know what? I'm going to make my life more miserable. I'm going to make, you got to make bricks before. Now you're going to have to find your own straw to make the bricks. And it was like terrible. And then the people of Israel pushed back on Moses because Pharaoh upped the ante and made it life more difficult. And the people of Israel, the Jewish people themselves pushed back on Moses. And they said, the foreman said to them, the foreman said to Moses and Aaron, may the Lord judge and punish you, Moses, you bum, for making us stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You put a sword into their hands and given us a, an ex, them an excuse to kill us. Like, you've made it worse. Guess what? When you serve Jesus, it gets worse. It gets harder. That's what happens. It's not easy serving Jesus in one sense or another. If you serve Jesus and you're trying to be a Christian coach in the soccer field, it gets tough. Or if you try to volunteer in the church, it gets tough. You know why? Because you'll come along and they say they want volunteers over there. Oh, well, okay, I'll volunteer. But they're already part of a friendship group. And you know how it feels to us? It feels like a click. It's hard to fit in. You know what I mean? Or you have a new idea, and they've been doing the same thing for 150 million years. And it's not just the church. It's every organization. It doesn't really matter, because human nature is human nature. And so you, try, you say, yeah, I'll, I'll volunteer. I'll try volunteering. And then they say, well, this is how we do things. Or you don't feel like you fit in. And then you say, you, you throw up your hands. Have you ever, anybody here ever thrown up their hands? And then you say, oh, you know what? I'll just quit. Quit. And you know who gives you a standing ovation when you quit because it's hard? You know who gives you a standing ovation? The enemy does. Satan does. See, God wants you to volunteer and serve him because Jesus instructed us to do that. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Get out of your stinking pews already and start serving Jesus. And you can either do it in the soccer field, living, coaching like Jesus with coach at soccer field, or you can partner with people in the church and do it together. But, but because it's hard, I just... Forget it. They don't really want me anyway. And you walk away and Satan stands up and says, brilliant, perfect. As he wants us. He, he wants you to feel really good about sitting in the pew doing nothing. He wants that. That's, that's, that, that's the, terrific, the most terrific thing. He wants you to quit. Now, remember last week I referred to Irv and Louise Bressler, who I love. 
who, who years ago, they went to West Lawn United Methodist, maybe still do, West Lawn United Methodist Church, and the guy, the pastor, the new pastor there said, hey, would you volunteer in this particular way and take care of some people? And it ended up forming into a, a, an organization called THT, Teens Helping Teens, that met in the basement of their house for I don't know how many years. And, and two of the people that went to that, Teens Helping Teens, every Sunday night, for a couple of hours every Sunday night, for several years, was my oldest daughter, Meredith, and then my second daughter, Erin. They went there, and Irv and Louise <coughs> poured into them. They had as many as 60 people, 60 teenagers, in their house, in their basement. And I'm sure that they had pushback. I'm sure they had problems. I'm sure things got broken in their house. I'm sure that Irv and Louise occasionally had a conflict with each other. If we weren't doing this, uh, this my, my salt shaker wouldn't have gotten broken because these teenagers are all over the house. Or maybe some teenagers were coming from other churches to Irv and Louise's house and the churches were mad at them because they were taking, stealing the teenagers away because that's how we sometimes behave. And there were times I'm sure that Irv and Louise felt like giving up. But do you know what Irv said to me when I called him up several weeks ago and said, Irv, tell me about this. You know what he said? You remember? I told you last week. He said, that was the greatest move of our lives. The greatest move. When you serve God in the way that you're called to serve him, when you figure out what your spiritual discontent, your holy discontent is, when you figure out where you fit and you serve where you fit, it is going to be the greatest move of your lives. That's what Urban Louise said, and that's what Moses would say. If, if we could talk to Moses, he had a boatload of headaches. I could go on preaching sermon after sermon about all the idiot things that the people of Israel did and all the headaches they put Moses through. And yet Moses would say, the best move I ever made in my life, like Irv and Louise Bressler was, when I decided to follow the call of God and live for the Lord in the way that he wanted to. Here's the challenge of the day. It's, it's from Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, where Jesus says, you are every one of you are the salt of the earth and you're not called to sit pretty in a pew satan wants you to do that he wants you to get out and serve in the way that you're intended to serve and the way you figure that out is trial and error do a drive-by volunteer say yes to everything over there and try it once and one of them might fit or something else but here's what you do here's what you'll actually see happen one here's the application one if you coach currently or if you do something else currently Let's take that experience in the path that would honor Jesus, where they're no longer praising you as coach, but they're praising Jesus Christ. Let's transition that. That volunteer experience into something really beautiful that would honor Jesus Christ. That would be one challenge for some of us. The other challenge would be for us to network in the church with each other. And here's how you can do that. You can go over there to the volunteer fair, and you might think, oh, it's all about signing up for something. It's not about signing up for something. You know what it is? It's about becoming known to the people over in that room and, and beginning the network where they, they begin to learn as you learn of them, oh, we share a common interest. We were all disturbed about this altar cover being such a mess. Like the two people come together and then you, you two people come together and you say, that was nuts. And then you say together, you, you, were you bothered about that too? Oh, yeah, that drove me nuts. Me too. And then you say, as you network together, and this networking should happen over in that room, and it should happen here among us, because it doesn't matter where it happens. The church is the church, not just in that room, it's here. You are all the church, and we're all to be salt in the world. Network with each other after church day, network with the people over there, get to know that this bothers you as much as it bothers me. And then say, as you've real, hey, were you bought? Yes, I was. You know what we could do? Let the Holy Spirit work. Watch this, watch this. Watch the Holy Spirit. We're both ticked off about that altar covering. And watch the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you know what we could do? You know what we could do? There's some pro uh, probably some older people that can't clean their house anymore. You know what we could do? We could go to other, together in the name of Jesus. You and me. And we could clean their house. Just one person, volunteer once a week. And we could pray with the person, care for them. Because they're just three years away from dying. In the last three years of their life, we could just bless them and love them in the name of Jesus. Maybe draw them near to Jesus. What do you think? Would you partner up with me? And she or he says, yeah, I could get it. You know what? The other person, I think I'd really like that. 
See, that's the church being the church. And that's what God has called us to do. Not that you two people that clean this lady's house feel that the lady says, oh, you're such wonderful people. No, 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 no. It's not you. It's like, Jesus is really wonderful. That's the end game. Not that you're wonderful. Jesus is wonderful. Only when they start praising Jesus does it count for Jesus. Let your light shine. Let, 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 your, let your, the world see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. That's the end game. So here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Listen to this. You are the salt of the earth. Get out of the stinking pews already and serve Jesus. And how you do that? One, you redeem the soccer coaching experience. That's one thing you can do. Or you partner up with other believers. And the path to par towards partnering up with other believers, other believers is to network with each other. You can network. That's a networking room. It's not a volunteer room. It's a networking room where you begin. To, you might volunteer in a way that doesn't even isn't even represented over there, but you begin to come together, or you figure it out here in this room, and you come together and serve Jesus. And you pray, Holy Spirit, give us ideas. Did anybody like that idea of cleaning an older person's house out? That was an interesting idea, wasn't it? You know when that idea came to me? When I was preaching in the first service. I didn't have that. That's not written down on any paper. That's just what the Lord does. So when, when you're talking to somebody else and you're exploring these things, just as that idea, while I'm speaking and having all kinds of thoughts in my head, that idea came to me, ideas will come to you. And you will become the church of Jesus Christ. And you'll serve him. There will be challenges and obstacles and difficulties, but you serve Jesus. And as you serve Jesus, at the end, you'll reflect and you'll say, that was the best move of my entire life along with Irvin Louise, and along with Moses. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for calling us like you called Moses. Moses, wow, big name in the Bible. And our names are nothing comparatively. But you can use us just like you used Moses. You can use us just like you used Irvin Louise Bressler in the lives of my, two of my three children. You can use us, Lord, and I pray that you would help us to redeem our coaching experience for your glory and honor and or partner with other believers in this church, in that room over there. Go over to that room, partner with it. Help us, Lord, to be your church and get out of these stinking pews and be salt and light in the world to the glory of your holy name. So people don't pat us up on the back and say, yeah, really good guy you are, real good woman you are. No. Really good God you serve. Lord, may it be, may it be, may it be. Work, unleash us, everybody. People that are pew warmers here in this room that never have ever volunteered before, I pray that you would stir them by your Holy Spirit, that they would not be satisfied with the life they're living and not be satisfied with merely volunteer, drive-by volunteering, but they, they would passionately follow, find their niche in life and how they are to serve you for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.